Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I won't stand in the light. That's not very clever. Um, we have half an hour, so I've got a fair bit to get through. Um, uh, the theme for this conference is people making the difference. So what I'm going to focus on, strangely, is people. Um, but before I get to the people part, I just want to set the stage in terms of what we're talking about and how those people actually make the difference. Let me begin with a really simple uh, definition. Uh, we are the Department of Innovation, so it's probably worth defining what innovation means. And really, uh, it was mentioned this morning, for those of you that might have been in the, in the panel session um, with some VCs in the Valley and some entrepreneurs, innovation is when you do something better, however you care to define better. But to do something better, you have to have the tools to do it. And generally speaking, the way you get those tools is by buying them. It's only that way you use it. So a simple definition of innovation is it's invention plus commercialization or adoption. And it's only through adoption that you get the impact of the innovation that was intended by the invention. And it's important we get that distinction right because the process does not end with the invention. It only begins with the invention. And the relative cost of doing the inventing is probably one hundredth of the cost of finally getting it adopted in the marketplace. And that reality is not particularly well understood, particu especially with people who are first timers at this. Might be very good engineers, very good scientists, come up with an invention in the backyard or in the lab, and they think, that's it, I've done it, problem solved. The problems are only just beginning. Um, if you're gonna get it into people's hands, it's gonna be a lot of hard work and it's gonna cost a lot more money than you ever imagined in order to get it there. And that is why a lot of our inventions don't see the light of day. We always say we're great at inventing things, but why don't we have all the big businesses? Well, that's part of the reason. It's the understanding of what it takes to make the conversion. The reason it's difficult to make a conversion is because inventors, and I restrict this discussion more to our technical colleagues, um, uh, value proposition and convincing someone to buy something has been known to our advertising colleagues for years. They routinely sell us things we don't need. Right? I don't know how many times uh, you, 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 know, you switch on the television and the, some ad for shampoo that's got micronutrients or something in it, and for some reason that convinces people to buy it. It's still the same shampoo it always was. They've just made up some sort of micronutrient and put someone in a white coat, but hey, people buy it. Why do they do that? They do that to convince you to buy it. They're not selling you on technical features and benefits because most of us don't analyze our shampoo. But we buy on emotion. We buy on a whole bunch of triggers that have nothing to do with features and benefits. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But fundamentally, when we've done the invention, we end up with the intellectual property. We end up with the product, the widget, the process, the service. We need to convert that into something other people will buy, whether they're consumers, other businesses, whatever the case may be. The answer to the question of why will our target customer buy it is very different from why does it work? And there are plenty of examples and I'm, I'm gonna relate one from my own experience uh, in, in a few moments. You've all heard of the valley of death. Companies, when they start out, you've got the invention, you wanna turn that into a commercial, uh, a commercial proposition and the first thing you start doing is spending money. You start spending money to try and turn what it is you have into something someone's gonna buy. You might build marketing collateral, you might have to redesign the product, get it the right color, get it the right shape, get it the right look, etc. Whatever the case, you start spending money in order to get your invention into a form that the market is going to want to receive. Now the area under this curve is how much money you've got to burn. Generally speaking, you will never have enough money to do this at a relaxed pace. This has to be done fast. It's got to be done so fast that you get to this point on the curve before you run out of area under the curve, right? So before you run out of money, you had better be turning the corner or your chances of getting more money or even surviving are very small. That puts every inventor that turns their mind to commercialization on a very high pressured pathway. And so understanding how you're going to fill this area with money is very important and understanding the difference between you wanting to achieve the business and someone else 
thinking you're worth investing in is the key to that challenge. All of these people down here, I don't know if you can see it up the back, but venture capitalists, angels, high net worth individuals, friends, families, the founders, private equity, etc. there's a million different sources of capital. But right down here, none of them want to know you because you are high risk, your chances of failure are high, and they have difficulty in understanding how you are going to get through here. The closer you are to here, the more of these investors want to know you, which is terrific because by the time you get to here, they all want to know you and you don't need them. So the challenge is how do you get started here? And that's really what we're all about. We're trying to bridge the gap that exists across here for when you know what you're doing, you know what it's going to take to get there, but you've got to convince other people along that path. It's not at all easy to do, and it means you've got to turn the business into a product. So not only do you have the challenge of working on your invention and turning that into a product someone wants to buy, now you need to turn your company into a product someone wants to buy, which normally boils down to turning yourself into a product someone wants to buy. And that's what the investor is looking at. So it's a complicated challenge, and everyone who's been through the startup process understands the difficulty of that challenge and understands why features and benefits of a product here is a very small proportion of what's important in surmounting that. Now, we can talk theory all the time. I'll come to an example just to illustrate just what a difference it makes in a moment. What we do from a government perspective, and I'll come back to the program um, uh, toward the end of this presentation, is we introduce a range of different incentive-based programs designed to help de-risk that very early process where most people don't want to know you, it's really yourself and the people that you can convince, sell yourself to, that are prepared to back you, the friends, the family, maybe a high net worth that you happen to know well, but if you don't happen to know one well, well, that's out of your, out of your range as well. But at this early stage, right, you're, you're having to get money from wherever you can get money. So what we do with the R&D tax incentive, while you're still doing development work, as a small company, you get up to 45 cents in the dollar cash back on whatever money you put out. So what the government's basically saying is, we're not, we can't help you invent. If you're going to invent, that's really up to you. You're the one with the skills. You either can do it or you can't do it. But what we will do is we'll extend your runway. We'll give you, we'll help de-risk your inventing process by providing you with cash back on, on your inventive expenditure. Once you reach this point though, where You've, you've, you've essentially finished the first phase of the R&D. You have a product or a process that is ready to go to the marketplace and you want to engage in that marketplace. Where do you go then? And that's where Commercialisation Australia kicks in. It kicks in at the interface between R&D and the commercial marketplace. You can continue to use the R&D tax incentive for your R&D activities, but as you start moving into very early commercial engagement, you still need some help. But at that point, it's different. It's different because no matter what the business, there are certain basic constructs which are common to all in terms of the extent of the engagement with a marketplace. How well do you know your customers? How well do you know your marketplace? How well do you know what it's going to take to get in front of them with something that they're prepared to buy? Irrespective of the technicalities of what it is you're delivering them. So at that point, we are able to assess on a merit basis what looks like it's heading down a viable path and what might not be yet sufficiently mature to even have a clue where it's going in terms of commercial viability. So at this point, with Commercialisation Australia, you'll see for R&D tax, there's a big dollar sign. Government provides money. That's really all the government can do to help you at that point. But here, once you start getting into this valley and you're engaging with customers, but you might not be over the line, there's a lot more that we can do to help, help businesses beyond just the money. And so what my, the rest of my presentation is going to be about is really... What are these plus signs? What is it that we provide beyond just the money? How does it make a difference? Why is it useful beyond just the money? And that's all about people that have been there and done that, that have commercialised new products. They might not have commercialised the same product that you're trying to commercialise, but they've had the experience of navigating this valley of death, going through processes with their customers, and they can relate that experience to you and they can help you with networks, contacts, etc. Because frankly, while you're here, what you need most is access to the right people. If you can get to the right people fast, your chances of success are significantly increased. So if we can build a network that helps you get 
to the right people faster, then we're providing something of value as well as some money to assist along the way. As you move further down this curve, more, more investment opportunities emerge, but it's still difficult while you're in here. And that's where there is the venture capital program, the IIF, which was announced today. Um, uh, another 100 million is being invested by the government in venture, in venture capital management areas so that slightly later stage companies can be picked up by venture managers and invested in, in order to take them through, hopefully, to the uptick here where you've got some positive cash flows and a real business. Okay, let's, let's get to some real examples. I, I, I mentioned before features and benefits um, really are just the very beginning of the curve. So I'll give you a story from, from, from my background just to illustrate this very, very clearly. Um, and this wasn't even something I invented, so I, I, I don't claim to be a, a, a brilliant inventor by any means. But I found a technology that was a mature technology, and I emphasise that. It was already a mature technology, so there was no technical risk, which has already puts me way ahead of most inventors, which when they start out also present with technical risk. But leaving that aside, I had no technical risk whatsoever. I had a product that I sourced overseas that I knew about through activities um, uh, otherwise. And I was introduced to some guys that wanted to come up with a solution to a, uh, a, a problem in gaming. It was a, a, a cashless gaming system. They wanted to use a, a card in a, in, a, in a poker machine instead of putting coins in. Simple idea. Um, uh, they wanted to eliminate the coins. And uh, I didn't have a view as to whether they should or shouldn't. Uh, they just spoke to me about how could we do it, how could we do it securely. So I sat with these guys for about uh, 20 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I had a solution for them. All the features and benefits laid out on, on the page. The, the, the basic uh, costing of this thing was already known. Uh, the technicalities of how it would be manufactured were known. Uh, where it would be manufactured was, was easily, easily uh, engineered. Uh, and the solution was pretty much done and dusted in 15 minutes. Now, I didn't get an order for two years. But I had the solution, features and benefits in 15 minutes. And that, to me, was the biggest lesson of all. Now, why did it take two years? Well, for starters, at the time I was 25. I had no money, I had no business, I just knew about this technology. And I had sat with these guys and I told them the answer. And they said, that's terrific. We're a statutory authority. We, we, we're funded by the state government. We want to roll out a statewide system. And you're saying we can rely on you. I say, sure, <laughs> you can rely on me. Yeah. And, and, uh, and what happens if you uh, uh, can't afford to buy the initial stock? And what happens if you can't service it, if everything goes wrong? And what happens and what happens and what happens? I had no answers straight away. All I had was the answer to their features and benefits question. There was a whole other bunch of stuff I had to put together. So I had to put deals together with a lot of people very quickly in order that I could stand toe to toe with a whole bunch of other would-be suppliers of a solution, because you're never the only one, who wanted that business. This statutory authority tendered openly for a solution, said, well, you bid in the tender. I said, I just solved the problem for you. Why don't you just give me the order? We don't work that way. We're government. So all of a sudden, I was in a tendering process with nine other bidders, all of them multinationals. And I was on my own to begin with. So I had to piece what was ultimately a value proposition together. I needed to be a multinational, and I needed to be a multinational in a hurry. There was no way I was going to build a business myself as a multinational. I had to find one that would back me. And so that's what it took. I had to cut deals. I had to cut lots of deals with lots of different partners. I needed a local card manufacturer. I needed a multinational to back me on the technology. I needed a local service group that could service this stuff with a, with a, with a performance uh, set of KPIs that were pretty demanding. They wanted, they wanted you know, 12-hour response time on fixing equipment in the field, and that equipment could be anywhere in the state of Victoria. And here I was, I'd just taken out a mortgage on a unit in Kew. I had not a penny to my name. I didn't even have a fax machine. We needed them back then. And, uh, and, uh, th and I was trying to win this business. So I was miles away from having a value proposition, but I was right there on features and benefits. Finally, in the end, I had a consortium that I put together and I had to give away a lot of the business. Obviously, I'm not going to get them on board for nothing. But I got them all together, we presented as a cohesive group, and we lost. 
And the thing was we lost because it never goes the way you think it should go. After 18 months, we were told we'd lost and I went back to the, the, the head of the technology arm of the, of the Victorian TAB at the time and I said, how could we lose? We have the best solution. You know we have the best solution. And he said, well, the independent consultants' reports did this, 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 and they all came back recommending this other technology. And I said, that's impossible. How could they do that independently? It doesn't make sense. So, of course, I would never admit to uh, breaking the rules, but somehow I managed to get a hold of the consultants' reports and I was able to analyse them and point out to the CTO at the time where they made an obvious leap of faith that demonstrated they weren't as independent as they were supposed to be. And he required that one of the consultants redo their report. And they came back with a recommendation to go with our technology. Funny that, independent report. Anyway, the, the, the moral of the story is there's a million different things that go wrong. Very few of them have anything to do with your technology and a lot of them have to do with the relationships, people, how bids are structured, all that sort of stuff. After two years, so Christmas Eve 91, I finally got the call from the general manager saying we're going to trial your technology. Uh, and that's, that's when that particular ride began and I cut in all of my partners and we built quite a successful business and had a had a $5 million contract within three months of that phone call, but we lost several times during that two years. Nothing to do with features and benefits. So I just wanted to emphasize that because a lot of companies will come to CA and say, look at our great invention, it solves this problem, look at the big market, we're there. Nope, you're not even close. You need to explain why they're gonna buy from you. And when you know the answer to that, you're there. But that's the hardest question to answer. So at Commercialisation Australia, what we try to do is not so much say, you know, ha-ha, you're not there. It's more about uh, we understand that it's difficult. We understand that there's a lot of challenges coming. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in place a network of people that can help you get over some of those issues faster. We're not going to solve it every time. Uh, some are going to fail. There's no doubt about that. But if we can help one or two in aggregate over time, help them accelerate the process of putting those, the deal structures together and getting to the right people so they can put their value proposition together, in aggregate, we will get more success than we would have otherwise, and that's the point of this program. So, yes, we have participants. Yes, they get funding. I'll come back to that. But we begin the people making a difference with the case managers. And since we're in Queensland, I'm going to talk about... Uh, our Queensland case managers. Just some quick head headlines here. We have 22 case managers around the country. They're motivated to work together. We want a networking effect. We don't want silos. So our case managers nationwide are a team. So if someone in Queensland's got a business that has a problem that someone in Victoria could help them with, they talk to each other. That's crucial. Otherwise, we've just got 22 individuals and they can only be so useful as an individual to the companies that they're looking after. But as a network, you get an exponential improvement in capacity to help. So, our first case manager. Now, I'm going to speak about Steve Davis. He's sitting right here, so uh, we'll see what colour he goes. Um, I just want to give you a bit of background on some of these case managers so that you get an appreciation for the sort of people we've got involved in the program, because these people are truly impressive people. They've done a lot of very good things in their careers, and they bring that skill and experience to all of the participants in Commercialisation Australia. So, Steve, first example, he has a, a PhD in physics. He invented his own mass spectrometer. He built a business out of that in the UK over a 12-year period, sold that to a channel partner and then came back to Australia. Right. He's an author in 12 patents um, and he's been a director of a number of different companies. So, Steve has done what it is a lot of our aspiring participants want to do and in that sense can be very helpful to his participants. So let's have a look at one example. Steve has a, has a company which is Brisbane based called NanoSilicon. Small company, five engineers here, five engineers in China. They just happen to be incredibly good at VLSI design, that is designing the physical layer of silicon chips, application specific chips. And they have as customers some of the biggest consumer electronic names in the world, Toshiba. Panasonic, and they are designing chips for those companies, which then rebrand them as their own and put them throughout their, their, uh, their supply chain. This, com this company has some real serious skill, but what did, what did we do for them? 
Steve recognised that this company's got a lot of potential, not just to sell their IP, but to productise their IP and actually make a lot more money out of what they're doing than they're currently making. They're making good money at the moment, charging a fee, but they could make 10, maybe even 100 times that if they can productise and sell their own products. Steve spoke to me about this company and I happen to have a former partner of mine that is an investor in fabulous semiconductor businesses out of Israel. We've put them in touch. We put the two in touch with each other and he's now giving feedback to this company on how to go about productizing some pretty sophisticated intellectual property that they've developed. And this company is ecstatic with the help they're getting. They only got a $50,000 grant to begin with, but they value this help way, way above the money that they got. Because if they listen to what he's saying, they could be on the path to raising many tens of millions and building potentially you know, hundreds of millions, if not billion dollar company. Now that's the potential that sits in front of them if they want to take it. Now maybe they will, maybe they won't. But that's the sort of potential that we need to exploit and we need to do more of that in Australia. But what we clearly have is talent. These guys are getting paid by the biggest names in the world to do some of the hardest engineering that can be done in silicon chip design. Keith Steele, another one of our uh, Queensland uh, case managers. Uh, Keith also has a PhD in chemistry, um, Master of Agricultural Science. He's got 30 years experience. He's been CEO or MD of a number of different companies, larger corporates, um, uh, chair, non-executive director of a number of startups, a wealth of experience. Again, it's great to have people like Keith available to work with younger companies that are doing it maybe for the first time. An example of a company that Keith is working with is Rhesus. Rhesus have come up with a really novel way, a novel manufacturing technique of extracting food grade cane juice from, um, uh, from sugar cane. Um, and interestingly, it hasn't been doable in such a way before and their manufacturing technique, they're piloting as a plant, which we helped them with our proof of concept grant, and they're now producing for some large customers. And this is a huge export opportunity as well as a local distribution opportunity. And what Keith has done is he's put them in contact with a number of his contacts in the brewing and distilling sector, which wasn't well known to the founder of this business when they first came in touch with Commercialisation Australia. Again, a tangible piece of value addition, not just we'll administer your grant, we do that too. But it's not just about hitting milestones on grants, it's about getting you to the right people at the right time. Stuart Hazel, another PhD, we're PhD heavy up here, um, but he's, uh, uh, Stuart's very strong in the biotech sector uh, with 35 years, 110 scientific papers to his name, He's authored patents. He's, he was the former CEO of Pan Bio, so he's got some commercial experience as well as a very uh, well-credentialed well academic record. Um, and he's also the state chair of Oz Biotech, which is the industry association for biotechnology companies. Now, from a biotech point of view, you're not going to get a better credentialed person in Australia, let alone in Queensland. So we have got top shelf people to help you with your opportunities. An example of uh, where uh, Stuart's been working with a company is uh, this company here called uh, CoughStim. And th that device is actually designed to stimulate coughing. So if you put that to your throat, you will cough. You will not be able to stop yourself coughing. And it's designed for people in a comatose state that would otherwise need to be um, invasively drained effectively because they can't cough. Right? So it's a very interesting invention. And uh, Stuart's helping them with uh, advice on regulatory matters because through his experience with PanBio, he's got a lot of experience in terms of getting medical devices through the regulatory uh, process. So again, value add beyond just putting in the money. And finally, Steve Telburn, um, who's uh, he's not a PhD, but he does have a master's so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a science background. And Steve's more in the ICT space, but he's also a veteran of a number of different startups and is currently actually working on a startup at the same time as working part-time as a case manager. So he's actively engaging as an entrepreneur, simultaneous with helping other entrepreneurs through, through their processes. Again, very, very well credentialed. An example of a company that he's working with is this Total Range Designs, which is a company that's come up with an, uh, an internet served A-frame. You know those A-frame boards that you see outside of shops? Well, this one has got a fully interactive screen and it's fed via the internet via a wireless network. And Steve's helping them with suggesting some new business models for the way in which they might go about monetizing the way in which they deliver their product to the marketplace. All very useful help in addition to, of course, getting grant funds. The next layer of networking that we're adding beyond the case managers is the volunteer business mentor network. And what we're doing there is we're attracting people 
to join our database of highly skilled people that can make a difference quickly to participants in the program. So people that have successfully commercialised IP, built businesses in the past, domain experts. So you might not be necessarily someone that's built a business, but you might be expert in your area, either technically or from a market perspective. You might be an expert at selling to Telstra. God knows anyone who's trying that for the first time needs your advice, right? So we need those sorts of people in the database. Uh, we need people with technical expertise. It might not be a business builder, but they might be you know, very knowledgeable on photovoltaics. We get a lot of photovoltaic type opportunities. Having someone with real skill at the technical end could be very useful, not only for the program, but for the individual company if that's their, if that's their field. So we want to attract all those sorts of people. And finally, professional investors, angel investors, anyone looking for an opportunity in the marketplace. We want them on the database. And the way it works is that you can scan our list of participants and you can tell us which ones you're interested in helping and we can organise a meeting and vice versa. Our case managers use the database to look for people with skills and experience that will help solve problems for participants. And we do this by taking all of your information into a smart form so that it can be uh, uh, intelligently searched with keywords to find people that are well matched to a particular problem that the company is having. And after the first meeting that we we, um, uh, we facilitate through the case manager, we leave it to you. So if you want to strike up a relationship with the participant or they with you, it's up to you. We back away, it's not a place for government. You deal commercially with the participant if you wish. The first meeting is not a commercial meeting, it's volunteer, so you don't charge, you don't sort of spruik business. It's not, we're not there to you know, uh, be a, a surrogate yellow pages. We're there to put people together that can really work with each other constructively. If you can and you want to take it offline, be our guest, that's what we're here for, to get people working with each other quickly. Okay, a little bit about the money because we have, uh, we have uh, made a uh, press release uh, today that there are some changes to the program. I'm not gonna go through in detail all the different uh, products, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we do have a stand out there in the exhibition hall, so if you want more detail on precisely the different grant components, by all means go to our stand and we can take you through that. Also, you wanna chase down some of the uh, uh, case managers in Queensland, you know what they look like now, so if you see one, you can always, uh, you can always try and get some information out of them. Um, they'll be very helpful, of course. Um, and um, uh, so we can go through those. But just to let you know some of the changes that we've made to the program to make it even more helpful for early stage companies. For our experienced executive, uh, previously there was a maximum of 200,000 over two years toward the hiring of a senior executive for the business. We've increased that limit to 350,000. It means you can pay more to get a higher caliber person if that's what's required for your business. Recognizing that you're matching it dollar for dollar, we figure you're not gonna pay someone more than they, more than you wanna pay them. But if you have to pay them more, we're prepared to support that. Up here at the early stage commercialization grant, there's a few changes, quite significant. Firstly, we've reduced the lower limit for this grant to 50,000, which will provide a fairly low end working capital type grant, which is not specifically tied to a project it's tied to the business and the business fundamentals rather than in the case of proof of concept being tied to a specific project where you're proving something to an audience who cares commercially. So we increase the flexibility of this grant. That's the first point. The second point is we've raised the maximum amount of revenue that a company can have and still apply for this grant to 50 million from 20 million. You still need to satisfy need for funding criteria. So if you're extremely profitable at 50, you won't be able to get a grant. But if you do need the money genuinely, even at 50 million, you can go for it. The next change is that we have terminated the repayment requirement for that grant. So in the past, if you took an early stage commercialization grant, you would have to repay it once you hit a certain trigger in terms of your revenue from the project, which was set at $100,000 in revenue. Now, there is no obligation to repay that grant. There were a number of administrative issues associated with that. It was quite onerous on a lot of companies. You need to be audited for 10 years, amongst other things. Quite, quite onerous. Uh, and what we've discovered is really, from the, from the government's point of view, in terms of stimulating this marketplace, our needs, and clearly the needs of our participants, are better served if we provide it as a grant and let them get on with their business. Um, and so that's what we've done going forward. That's a big change. Uh, and finally, we will be introducing new eligible activities in the, uh, sorry, eligible expenditures in the new year. We haven't finished writing the rules yet, so I can't announce the detail, but uh, more flexible support for innovative manufacturing. So if you're building a manufacturing plant, there'll be a greater diversity of support we can provide to 
uh, innovative manufacturers beyond what is currently available. And more detail will be available on that early next year. So that's the summary of the changes. Um, and um, I think they're all positive from a participant applicant perspective. Uh, and I think what uh, the, the net effect will be, we'll get more quality applicants coming forward. Uh, it will probably lift the standard um, of, of the companies participating in the program. That's not a bad thing. It just means that everyone can still aspire to, to getting into the Commercialisation Australia program. And once in, you see the, the calibre of help that you're going to get in addition to the money it's really starting to pay dividends for a lot of companies, including the ones that I've just highlighted today, but there's probably another 20 companies at least that have got tangible results already directly from the help they've received, in addition to what they've been able to achieve alone with the money that's been provided. So the results are starting to come. I'm encouraged by the standard that is systematically getting better in terms of what's coming into the program uh, and what's coming before the board from what I see coming from the field, is really getting very encouraging. We're seeing a lot more really good stuff. So all the news is good at this point. To give you the headline stats, um, uh, we have, uh, as I say, 22 case managers, 177 companies, participants in the project right now. So any of you thinking about becoming volunteer business mentors, that's a lot of companies to choose from. You can slice and dice them by geography, sector, whatever interests you. Um, it's, it's a very attractive, critical mass repository of interesting deals. Um, just short of 72 million has been invested around the country. You can see the numbers around the country. Queensland's performing particularly well. 37 participants already, 46 New South Wales, 37 Victaz. We've got nine in South Australia, Northern Territory. We do have our first in the Northern Territory. Um, and uh, we have uh, 12 uh, over in WA. All of these numbers growing reasonably quickly now because the success rate at the board is now very high. It's well over sort of two thirds, it's, it's over 80% in fact. So by the time you get to the board, if you listen to the case manager carefully, by the time you get to the board, your chances of getting a grant are high, but you've got to get to the board. So I stress it's very important to work with the case manager to understand what's required in order to qualify for these grants. They're very helpful. And uh, so far the feedback's been very good, even from those that haven't been able to get a grant, the help they've received through the process has been useful. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time.